We have received over 70 questions by email from grammar teachers. They, uh, we just thank all of you who have sent them. They cover a broad spectrum of grammar teaching issues. Um, a number of the questions were very similar, so we chose the questions that were submitted by the most teachers, and out of those, we had to choose uh, just one to post on the screen. So if your question, uh, if you ask the question and somebody else's uh, question is up there, it's just because we got so many. Uh, we, and because we got so many, instead of focusing on just a few, uh, we decided to address as many as we could in the time available. So that means that we decided in favor of breadth rather than depth. If there is anything you want to follow up on, you can always contact us through email or our websites, and we will post those at the end of the session. Uh, in the interest of time, we divvied up the questions by deciding who would take the lead in answering, and then the others can jump in after that. Uh, and we, source, of course, decided that uh, if we're going to answer as many as we can, we have to stick to time limits. Um, as I said, we could just sit here and talk about grammar teaching until midnight at least, but we only have until 11.15. Just lied to you. I said they were all emailed by teachers. Um, well, I'm, I guess I'm a teacher. I decided to post the first question. <laughs> um, this is a question that I have asked many, many people over the years. I am a poster child for grammar translation. Uh, after four years of French in college, I could read and write quite well, and I could not carry on proverbially a conversation about the weather. So whenever I run into these people that uh, Michael so much admires and hates, <laughs> who are successful language lear second language learners, I always ask them this question. And I'm going to pose it. We have two successful language learners here, so I'm going to pose it to them now. Keith and Michael, as successful second language learners, how would you describe the role of grammar in your own language learning experiences? And I think Keith is going to start. Okay, and we'll be seated for these questions. Can you hear me okay in the back? How's it? Yes? All right, good. Um, my foreign language experience started in high school with French, a little bitty school in Mississippi, two years of French, and of course we learned grammar, grammar, and grammar, and I was actually very good at it uh, back then. Um, then after that, I had a year of Spanish in high school, and when I went overseas, before I went to Saudi Arabia, I studied Arabic. Before I went to Malaysia, I studied some Malay, and then before I went to Japan, I studied some Japanese. And for me, learning grammar, there were two goals, I guess I would say, in mind. One of them was, I actually am an intelligent person in my first language, and I would like to come across to all these other people that I'm meeting um, as an intelligent person in my second, third, fourth language. And yes, it's true that we're all going to make grammar mistakes. That's part of the process. But if there is a way to limit how non-grammatical or how incorrect my second, third, fourth language is going to sound, I'm all for that. And I thought grammar teaching really helped with me and, and a, a lot there. Now, that's talking about accuracy, but grammar was also important because grammar doesn't just mean accuracy. In fact, I would probably say it's not anywhere near the top of the meaning. For me, grammar is about structures, patterns that will actually let you do something. You know, I'm a tennis fanatic, and I remember in Japan, again, very it's one thing if you study French and Spanish as, a, as an English speaker, but J Japanese, Arabic, these are, they do things really differently in those languages. And I remember in Japan, people would call me on the telephone, one of my biggest fears, because it's easy to act to operate face to face, right, right, work with the body language, but on the telephone we had nothing. And they were calling me up to say, basically, yes, let's play tennis tomorrow at 9 o'clock at these courts 10 miles away. I didn't have a car. So I was trying to say, I'm going to take the train. Can you pick me up? Will you meet me at the train station? I needed, as a language learner, if clauses. If I take the train, what do I do? So for the first year there, I remember I would call and say, tomorrow I take the train, OK? <laughs> you be there, OK? OK. <laughs> And then that's how I did if clauses. And I realized this, I don't, I'm a pretty good tennis player, but I sound pretty not so good in Japanese. And finally, someone explained to me how to do if clauses in, in my Japanese class. And they're actually, it's a much more, you think English is complicated with if clauses, Japanese has many kinds of if clauses. So for me, it's about sounding intelligent or as equal to whatever I am in my first language, and then also being able to function. I'll turn over to Michael there. Yeah, um, 
my main foreign languages are French and German, and uh, it's perfectly clear to me that um, I don't speak them brilliantly, but I speak them much better than I would if I hadn't um, learnt a good deal about their grammar while I was learning them. But the, the most striking case for me is in two other languages, which I don't know terribly well, uh, Italian and Spanish. I've got upper intermediate reading knowledge of both of them. I can read Italian and Spanish fairly well. Um, I can speak Italian up to a point. I can't speak Spanish. And the difference is not really to do with the amount of exposure, the amount I, uh, I know of the languages. It's very simply that early in my approach to Italian, I was going on holiday to Italy. I bought Teach Yourself Italian, and I learned Lessons 1 to 6. <laughs> and Lessons 1 to 6 in that kind of book at that period had all the verb grammar. So I can make uh, present tenses, past tenses, futures, and conditionals in Italian, and I can make sentences. I've never done that with Spanish. I know almost the same amount of Spanish from a point of view of vocabulary, but I can't make a single sentence. I can ask for a couple of beers and say thank you, and that's it. I can't, <laughs> can't make sentences because I don't have the verb grammar. I could talk in infinitives, but I don't want to. <laughs> Well, I have to say I'm really glad that they didn't say grammar has nothing to do with successful language learning or else we all could have just gone home. <laughs> so thank you. Um, the next, I'll turn the second question now over to Michael Swan. Yeah, um, it's an interesting question. If grammar teaching works, why does grammar teaching not equal grammar acquisition? Specifically, why do students frequently make mistakes with the simplest grammar rules for years? Um, I suspect uh, there are two ways to take this question, and I think it was meant as a rhetorical question, meaning we teach grammar, but students don't get it all right, so what's the use of teaching grammar? Uh, that's very easy to deal with. It's like saying we plant seeds, but the seeds don't all come up, therefore it's no use planting seeds. <laughs> <laughs> well, planting may not guarantee growth, but it beats the hell out of not planting seeds. <laughs> um, that's, that's just faulty logic. But behind it, there is a genuine interesting question, which we don't really know the answer to. Uh, we teach grammar, but they do go on making mistakes. Some mistakes fossilize. Why? Um, we don't entirely know why, but I think we can come up with some suggestions. Um, first of all, there's too much grammar in a language for everybody to get it all right. Something's got to go. You can't get it all right in real time, especially when speaking. Some things have to be dropped. Um, also, um, an interesting question is whether the point of grammar stands out for the learner, whether it's salient. Does the learner actually perceive this point? Um, it needs to stand out psychologically. And the learner may not have a mental slot for that particular point of grammar. If the learner speaks Chinese, then the learner doesn't have a mental slot for making plural nouns, because Chinese doesn't put plurality into its grammar. And that makes it psychologically more difficult to pay attention to plurals in a language that does have plural nouns. That thing gets under the radar. Um, people who speak Finnish speak a language that doesn't have anything much that corresponds to our prepositions. They express those kind of relationships differently. Um, and F Finnish speakers notoriously tend to drop prepositions in English. And another thing that gets under their radar. Um, not only psychologically, but perceptually, this can happen. Um, a lot of the world's languages don't have words that end in S for instance, or in de. Um, a lot of Oriental languages have a very limited number of final consonants. And these things can be surprisingly hard to hear, um, simply to perceive, if your language doesn't have them and if you're not used to them. Um, so sits, sit, wait, waits, waited, may all sound rather similar to some learners. And functionally, uh, a point may not be very sort of easy to spot, it may not stand out, because it doesn't seem to have much point. And for third person S, which is the thing people always raise in this connection, 
It's an easy rule, we teach it, but they go on getting it wrong, why? Well, third person S gets the thumb down on all of these counts. Um, it's, it's pointless. <laughs> For many learners, it's not very easy to perceive, doesn't correspond, doesn't have a part in a salient system that people understand and can relate to. So that's one of the reasons, I think, why. And I would just add to that, uh, for me, that if a student can use grammar correctly in exercises and on tests, that's good. Uh, that means the student has a good start. It does not mean the student has reached the finish line. The finish line is internalization. So basically, for me, this questioner is asking, why does internalization take so much time and how does it work? And the answer is, we don't know. We don't know how or when the brain kicks in to internalize grammar. Mistakes are absolutely natural. I don't think they're anything to worry about um, unless they become fossilized and then you have a more difficult problem. Keith? Um, I would add to that that um, agreeing with Betty that errors are, now we see errors as a natural part of the process. It's not this either or a light switch that you've taught something and then suddenly they get it. It's um, going to take time to develop and of course there will be mistakes along the way, which is actually good for our job security if you think about it, right? <laughs> I would also look at the question that's been posed which was simplest, you know, I think it was something about um, simplest mistakes or something like that, right? Or I think it was uh, the simplest grammatical grammar rules. Define simple. Because I think one thing is that people will say they just don't get articles. Okay, I, if you have something like enjoy plus a gerund, I can see that might be simple. But when you have something like articles, articles are treated as if there's only one article usage. When in fact there might be eight or nine or ten different article usages, which we lump together in one grammar point called articles. I think that's why present perfect is so tough, because present perfect has so many usages, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. and the next question? Well, I, but it is also true of final S, which uh, the, yeah. the rules are simple, but it has so many uses. It makes a verb singular and it makes the noun plural. I mean, what kind of sense does that make? Um, and are there other, other, you don't put it here, you do put it there. All right, we'll go on to the next question, which is for Keith. Okay, question number three is about explicit grammar teaching or not. The question is, I would be curious uh, as to your stance on direct teaching versus experiential learning. What is a model argument for the explicit teaching of grammar as a foundation for communication? And so the, I'm going to talk about the first question a little bit more here. And that is, I think, getting at um, explicit teaching versus an immersion sort of situation, where if we just expose you to enough grammar, you'll magically pick this up. I would still say that even if you're going to teach in that, in that immersion type of program or experiential program, it's, for me, it's about speeding things up. It's about being efficient. My students don't have the luxury of 21 years to figure it out. So they're with me for 14 weeks, let's say. If I'm going to, if I'm required, as some programs might require you to actually teach in an experiential kind of way, it's one thing just to be a native speaker at the front of the room babbling and giving lots of I plus 100, you know, just blah, 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 on and on and on. It's quite a different thing that you actually know what the ESL uh, language structures are so that you can actually provide a rich context. In other words, if I know that today I'm working on verb to be and I'm not just doing verb to be plus anything, I'm going to do verb to be plus you know, subject, verb, and an adjective. So he is Chinese or you know, he is tall or something like that. As opposed to when I watch a lot of beginning teachers who make the mistake of uh, he is in the room, he is hungry, uh, Arabic is written from left to right, and they are writing. And I'll have beginning teachers tell me, yes, that's all M is and R. Yes, it is, but you've missed the point. And to the poor ESL student who's trying, that you said to, if we give you lots of input, which is totally comprehensible there, because I'm writing Arabic in, the, in, the, in that order, um, with lots of demonstrations, it's comprehensible, but you haven't introduced a pattern and primarily because you didn't know the pattern, which goes back to my previous point that you shouldn't be teaching the grammar if you're not really familiar with the grammar yourself there. All right. Um, for me, it's about efficiency and saving students time. Uh, I think the second respondent there is Betty. Is that right? 
Um, okay. Um, my, the, what I would say for the uh, first one, the stance on direct teaching versus experiential learning, that was what my whole 10 minutes was about. Do both. Um, this is not an either or situation. Too often we end up with either ors, uh, and in the classroom is a place of synthesis where, where many methods come together. Um, as for the second one, the explicit teaching of grammar as a foundation for uh, communication. I'd like to make sure that when we're talking about explicit grammar teaching, uh, that we agree sort of on the definition of what that is, and to me it means giving students the chance to understand how English is put together, how it works. It's not memorizing rules and things like that, it's understanding how it's put together. And it includes both deductive and inductive learning strategies. Sometimes students, and I think mostly actually, students figure, th figure the patterns out for themselves with the explanatory information there as needed to help them figure it out. And both, in, there's a constant interplay of in, inductive and deductive, which goes back to uh, what I was saying earlier, you have to do both. You cannot divide inductive and deductive in the lang uh, language classroom, in my experience. Um, I would also say that grammar underlies usage in all skill areas. To me, grammar is the glue. It is what holds language together and makes it intelligible. Mike, anything to add? I'd just like to add very briefly that um, it, it's important not to generalize it depends what points of grammar we're talking about, how much time there is available, how much exposure there is for experiential learning, and the answers can be very different under different circumstances. Good. All right, the next question um, is fitting grammar into a curriculum. I'm an old curriculum designer, so this is a fun question for me. Uh, what are the benefits or drawbacks of setting aside a grammar course in a skill-based curriculum? Um, well, I'll take that first question first, then I'll come to the next one. Um, as I'm sure you know, there are two ways, two, this is just broad strokes, two ways of fitting grammar into uh, a grammar component into a curriculum. Uh, very broad strokes. One is you can start with a developmental skills activity and slot in the grammar. That's generally called focus on form these days. Or you can start from a grammar base and slot in developmental skills activities. I call that grammar-based teaching. The research that I have read says that the two approaches, focus on form, grammar-based teaching, are equally effective. So the choice depends completely, I believe, on the teaching situation and the teacher's preferences uh, and um, the, who the students are. Um, if, however, uh, for example, if you're teaching three contact hours, you have one three-hour class uh, a week with your students, I'm sure focus on forms would be the much better uh, choice. Uh, if, however, and this is the question here, if, however, you're teaching in an IEP with 25 contact hours or more, it makes a whole lot of sense to me to have a separate grammar class to have a class where students can really focus on the structure of English, of English, see how it works, play around with it, ask all the questions they want to ask, and get a lot of uh, feedback on um, accuracy. Students don't like to make mistakes. They like to have time to focus on accuracy, uh, and not just here and there when they're doing a little reading or doing a task or something. Um, I think probably for me the most important reason for having a separate grammar class is that it gives the students a chance to really get a handle on a structure. You cannot teach the passive in 15 minutes. I don't think students can catch the passive uh, just by noticing occasionally. And the, my experience with students is that they prefer to get the whole picture. They prefer to get the whole concept that they, um, for example, if you teach you know, one adjective clause over here and then I'm, I'm stick in another adjective clause a few uh, weeks later, it, it seems very random and piecemeal to them. 
Uh, and as a teacher, I will just say it drove me crazy to teach piecemeal grammar, and I always wanted to, to get the whole concept of the structure uh, communicated to my students. Uh, and as a curriculum des uh, designer, it's just logistically easier. I think it's a nightmare to say, okay, you teach this chapter, you teach that chapter, you teach that chapter, we'll split the book, or no, you teach the passive and you teach pronouns. I, it just, it's very confusing for teachers and students. And then finally, a grammar class is, I really want to em emphasize this, a grammar class is a developmental skills class. It's not teaching rules. You are developing usage skills. And that only complements and supports um, other skill-based classes. Then the second question up here, right now I am teaching a basic ESL class and the grammar is built into the lessons. That would be focus on form. At what level is it appropriate to teach grammar as a standalone topic? That would be grammar-based teaching. Um, I will simply say, as, as long as they know the alphabet, I think you can teach grammar as a standalone topic. And indeed, I know this goes against conventional wisdom the, today. I don't understand where that conventional wisdom came from. I haven't quite traced that back. Uh, but my experience is, my observation is, that a grammar class makes the new language less daunting for the student, not more daunting. I don't know if you agree with me. Um, ditto. Okay. Um, how's that? <laughs> uh, I don't yield my 30 seconds yet, though. Um, I would say most of my teaching experience is with IEP students, intensive English programs, and yes, it's just much more efficient if you have a, a separate class that's labeled as grammar. It's not even dealing with grammar, per se, or language teaching, as much as it is just logistics of running a large program. This way, we know it's being covered. Otherwise, your, your teachers are very busy. I thought you were doing it. I thought I was doing it. No, who's going to do this? The writing teacher's teaching it. No, it's the reading teacher. Actually, if you have a separate grammar class, it makes more sense. And also, I'll say that as a person who's actually been in an, in an intensive program, for example, in Japanese or in Malay, I know that, for me, having a class that was called grammar, structure or AD, whatever it was covered or called, I appreciated the opportunity of knowing for sure I could go to that class, raise my hand and say, you know, I heard someone say whatever. And you told us, or the book told us, that you can't use an ING there. Why? And adult learners, they want to know why. You know, uh, and that entails giving a grammar explanation. So yes, I would agree with that. The second question, at what level? I can't imagine why beginning students would be denied access to grammar. Um, they, if you're an adult learner, you certainly have questions in your head as to you're trying to produce something and you hear something different, you want to know why. What's the difference? Yesterday you told us to do this, today the book says do this. Is it the same or not? That for me is grammar. Michael? I have nothing to add to those masterly analyses. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next one then, Keith? Question five is teaching grammar to young learners. By a show of hands, how many people are K-12 teachers? K-12 teachers. I deal with K-12 teachers a lot uh, with a very innovative program actually in Arkansas, um, uh, very forward-looking in terms of training what they call ESOL, in Florida ESOL, ESOL teachers. The question is, I work with young learners from age three to eight. How do you see grammar taught for this age group? And the other is that we have preschool and kindergarten aged ELLs, at what point should grammar be introduced, if at all? Um, the way K-12 is often divided up in workshops that I do, K through two, or P to pre-kindergarten, is often done separately. I would say that if you have students, and I'll use the United States here, if you have students who are non-English speakers, who are in your pre-kindergarten, first grade, second grade classes, they actually are going to have the benefit of 18 or so more years of being exposed to English, provided that they are not living in a situation, I'll use Orlando where I am, where they are in Spanish, for example, all day, they go home to Spanish, and the only input they're getting is from you, the teacher, if you happen to be a teacher who doesn't speak Spanish to them at school. In that case, they're really not in an ESL situation. They're really in an EFL situation. 
in which case it mirrors that kind of development. But if you're in kindergarten through second, I would say that you're going to have the benefit of all those years. And actually, after a, a certain point, fourth, fifth grade, you'll begin to mirror in some ways what's happening to the native speakers who are uh, being exposed to, to the same language. The example I, or the problem I always run into with a lot of K-12 teachers is they're not familiar with what ESL language issues, for example, grammar or vocabulary, really are. And when they're trying to put together their lesson plans, they're not sure of how to run the show in their class. So you have a class of 24 learners. Let's say a third of them don't speak English. If you're a fourth grade math teacher, your job is to teach fourth grade math to the whole class, not just to one third and not just to two thirds. But the example I always give is, take a simple song if you're doing the P, you know, the, the PK one, two. Old MacDonald had a farm. I'm not going to sing it. That's my gift, not singing it. <laughs> but Old MacDonald had a farm. That's a, a song that you might be using with your kids already. And you think, well, gee, is there grammar there? You have to put something in that lesson plan slot for the state. What would you put? If just the repetition, again, if there's a pattern here, Old MacDonald had a farm. What grammar is being taught there? There's past tense. There's had. Every line of that song is had, had, had. And so you also learn that it's on his farm. So if there's a male person, we don't do its or her or their. We use his. You also learn that the animals in English, if there's only one of them, as in had a cow, a duck, they have to have an a uh in front of them. Um, and you also learn that with farm, we don't say in a farm, or we, we don't just say the farm. You have to put the word on there. The point is that with young learners, no, you can't go to the blackboard and, and, and say, today's lesson is present perfect, class. You know, <laughs> pretend you can write with a pencil now. You can't do that. <laughs> And you wouldn't do that, but, but they're just the same way that you wouldn't be teaching those students that way anyway. They're doing lots of songs and repetition and doing lots of games. I taught second grade. I'm certified secondary, but taught second grade in Japan for one semester of those six years, and I lived to tell it. But uh, the thing is, we use lots of games and lots of activities. If you've never taught elementary school, the biggest surprise for me was I couldn't go into a 50-minute class with three activities. We needed 33 activities, right? But the thing is, I, there are patterns that would be repeated over and over. And to me, yes, of course you want to be teaching grammar, but in an appropriate way for students at that age. Does anybody else want to add anything? Uh, no, I think Michael and I have only taught adult students, so I think we will just leave that with you. Thank you. Um, the next one uh, is for me. Uh, sometimes students find it difficult and boring to learn grammar. What are the teaching methods of making grammar easier and interesting to them? Well, the first thing I have to say is that I always loved teaching grammar, and I think grammar is a whole lot of fun, so maybe I'm biased. Um, over the years, I've had the opportunity to visit classes where teachers are using my textbooks, and they've been very gracious to, um, to let me sit in on the classes. But I've noticed in some classes that the students are disengaged and bored and staring at their shoes or looking out the window, whereas in other classes the students are engaged and active and having fun, and they're using exactly the same materials, but different methods and different teachers. What I have noticed is that the teachers in the boring classes often seem to think they are teaching subject matter. They'll lecture the students as though they were teaching biology or geometry. They will plod through the exercises as though the only important thing is to get the right answer. Uh, and then again, they will lecture the students if they make a mistake. Uh, and then they will drill the students on terminology, at which point I am sitting in the back of the room absolutely tearing my hair out. That is not what teaching grammar is all about. What I notice about the teachers in the engaged classes is they don't lecture their students. They have an easy give and take and really lead their students to discoveries. Uh, they treat errors lightly and positively, like, ah, you made a mistake. Isn't that wonderful? What a good teaching opportunity. 
Um, they don't have students using meta-language. They don't have students memorizing rules. They don't have students defining terminology. This is not, that's subject matter stuff. We're not teaching subject matter. We're using grammar as a means to an end, as a, as a tool. But very importantly, they have a, a lot of variety, a lot of activities, a lot of interactive and group work. And Keith mentioned some of this in his, uh, his opening remarks. But there are lots of interesting and fun things to do working from a grammar base, from pantomimes, chain stories, role playing, true-false games, interviews, writing advice columns, problem-solving tasks, logic puzzles, number puzzles, and many, many, many more. That, will, that you can fit into uh, focusing on target structures. Uh, then the second question, um, how can we help our students develop their linguistic accuracy during extemporaneous speech? Well, just very quickly, uh, one idea that, and something I used to do, um, it, it, well, just a generalization, I believe it is a good idea to, to have exercises and practice that specifically encourage self-monitoring and, importantly, peer monitoring, that the students are monitoring the accuracy of each other. Uh, one method I like is to uh, have one student in a pair or a group function as the grammar listener. Uh, to listen for a particular structure. A very quick example, uh, if you're doing a chain story in groups, uh, the grammar, listen, the grammar listener listens for ED endings, listens for irregular verbs, listens for tense shifting, and gives immediate feedback. So the students are using language extemporaneously. They're having fun and paying attention to, gram uh, to uh, accuracy at the same time. Anything to add? What should I add? Um, I, I think the key words what Betty mentioned, uh, activities, going back to the act, the action, and it's the, the number of different activities that you're going to do in your class. Um, trying to think, first again, it requires you to know something about grammar. So it's not just I'm going to teach this rule today, but I want to teach this grammar pattern, which will allow you to do what? And I always try to think, what do my students actually want to do with this language down the road? So if they're going to have to go to a job interview, then we might set up a mock job interview. But again, I'm always aware or trying to get them more aware of the grammar that they're going to use, the patterns that they'll need as they perform that particular activity. One idea in terms of getting, honing your own teaching skills is you're probably not teaching in a school where you're the only teacher. And you probably hear other students say, much to your chagrin, I really like Miss So-and-So's class. And you have to wonder, as we all have, what is she doing that's so good why they keep talking about her class and why aren't they talking about mine? So. Just ask one of your colleagues to go visit different classes. And you'd be amazed. I don't care how many years you've been teaching. You go to a presentation. You've been going to conferences 20-something gazillion years, as we have. And you go to a presentation, and you think, gee, I could really use that. Or you also think, I could never use that. I would never do that to my kids. That also is valuable information. And how many times have you seen an activity demonstrated where you think, that's a great activity if only they would and you're able to do that, to tweak it, to make it fit your students. So try to observe as many classes as you can by their teachers and take advantage as, as you have here at this conference of seeing other activities. Michael? Nothing to add. They've said it. <laughs> they said <Okay>. it all. <laughs> um, OK, the next one is for Michael. Yeah. Um, question is, is there any evidence that students have better learning outcomes when grammar is presented and practiced in context? Well, there's no robust evidence about learning outcomes for any you know, approach to teaching grammar, really. Um, obviously, we're all in favor of contextualization, as we're in favor of democracy and motherhood. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we should be. But it is important to avoid oversimple attitudes, I think. There's a current dogma um, put forward by people who are interested in task-based learning that acquisition can only occur during communicative activity. It's a dogma. There's no evidence for it. Um, there's another type of dogma which dismisses sentence-level practice, saying that the meaning and use of grammatical features can only be understood by referring to the wider discourse context. Well, it's true for some grammar points and not for others. Mm -hmm. uh, it's desperately oversimple. Um, 
I think there's a strong case when we're teaching certain points of grammar for the old style mechanical sentence level practice. If a grammar structure is hard to get hold of, passives is a good example. It, c it can be quite hard for learners to learn to put passive verbs together. Um, practicing the form without thinking too much about the meaning at sentence level before moving on to more contextualized practice seems to me a very good thing to do. Um, I would add to that, how many words does it take to create a context? Uh, you don't have to have a whole long passage to have a context. I'll just give you one quick example. If you have the sentence, can I go outside? No context, doesn't mean anything. Add a few words. Mom, can I go out inside and play after I finish my homework? And you have a perfectly understandable example of the use of can to ask permission and the social situation in which it's used. So even sentence level grammar can have uh, easy, easily recognizable context. I would just add that, again, the wording of the question about practice in context, the opposite of in context is not no context. Right. And again, the, some of the earlier people in our field have um, stolen the really good vocabulary to describe some of these issues. And so we talk about natural, that's a good word, the opposite being contrived. In context, so I'll vote for that because it's in context as opposed to out of context. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you that with the research that's been done on vocabulary, at least, having extensive context is not what you need, or, or in, in actual empirical studies does not, it doesn't uh, provide as good a results as even something as simple as translations. So what might seem intuitive to you, or you've been led to believe is, is the right answer after two decades of listening to the naturalist, um, there really isn't evidence for this. There isn't, there's actually contrary evidence with vocabulary, and I don't see any evidence at all in the grammar area. I would agree with Keith. <laughs> ah, all right, the next one um, is for me. This is about grammar, writing, and correctness. I think this is the topic we got the most questions on. Um, our coordinator made us mark every single error. Was this correct? Should we correct all the students' mistakes when we're correcting a composition, for instance, or focus on specific structures? When, if ever, in a program's writing curriculum, should a writing teacher address grammar? My institution has no discrete grammar class. Well, the first thing I'm going to say in uh, relationship to the first question about the coordinator making them mark every single error, uh, that is a decision teachers need to make, not coordinators. Um, I firmly believe that coordinators can give guidelines, there can be goals of the program, but there are so many different teaching situations and teachers need to decide what their particular goals are in a particular assignment and how they feel they are most effective. Uh, but that's just my personal opinion. Uh, there is no one right way for every teacher in every teaching situation, in every res uh, writing assignment at every level. Teachers have to be allowed to stay flexible. And so sometimes you will correct all the errors, and sometimes you'll correct just one error, sometimes you'll correct just a few. Uh, there are many different situations. But I also want to address uh, the, 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 the students that I taught, um, advanced level university students, pre-university students or students at the university. And here's what I did and why. I pointed out, I marked every error that I thought the students could correct themselves. I wrote in corrections when I didn't think the students knew how to make the correction. If I did not understand the meaning of a sentence or a paragraph, I didn't mark any grammar at all. I said, I don't understand what you're talking about. Please rewrite or please see me after class. And then we would deal with the grammar after we dealt with the meaning. But I did not let errors pass unnoticed. I would get some generation 1.5 students in my class, uh, at the, the, the freshman class, and nobody had ever told them that their English was not up to academic expectations. I think that is an English teacher's job. I think that's what they pay us for. That is why they are in our classes. 
So as a writing teacher, my job is to help students improve all their writing skills, content, organization, expression, and correct usage. And I think letting errors pass continually simply does a disservice to students. Uh, for me, teaching grammar is just part and parcel of teaching good writing. My own feeling is that um, generally correcting every mistake is giving students more information than they can handle and act on. And there are situations where it can be very counterproductive. Uh, I was talking to a teacher of English from a German secondary school. She said a lot of her colleagues correct all the students' mistakes in writing and in speech. And the effect of that is that what they get in their classes is what's called in German fehlerfreies Schweigen, which means silence with no mistakes. <laughs> the kids won't say anything because they're just so discouraged. They're afraid of being corrected. And I think, uh, certainly as Betty says, it depends on the situation, depends on the teacher's purposes. But for me, that level of perfectionism is very often disastrous. And I would add that looking at the research on composition and error correction, there really isn't any research that shows one way or the other that correcting mistakes uh, at the composition level is going to produce magical results. And I really don't, if I believe that correcting every single mistake on the paper would result in better learning, which I don't, I don't think any of us do, yes, I would mark the papers out of guilt because it's my job to do this as a teacher. I don't think we get paid enough, though, to mark all of those papers and mark all the mistakes. But if it paid off, we would do it. But it doesn't, so don't. <laughs> All right, Michael is next. Yeah, talking now about language varieties and change, we've got three questions here. The grammar in written English differs from that in spoken English. How do we deal with this? What do you do when a grammar structure is changing in usage, especially when informal spoken usage is starting to be used in more professional or academic settings? One example would be everyone has their own opinion. And what do you say to students when the textbook says that the verb love isn't used in the progressive and they see I'm loving it in a TV ad? <laughs> McDonald's have got a lot to answer for here. <laughs> um, I think essentially it's a matter of increasing students' language awareness. They need to understand that there's not just one correct form of a language so that they don't get bewildered by variation and change and by the fact that rules in the books don't correspond to the whole of the language. Um, I think we need to tell them where noticeable changes are going on, that this is happening, tell them why. With progressives, like I'm loving it, this is a structure that came into English centuries back. It's been slowly making its way through the language. There are still a few verbs that are holding out in their trenches, but they're being overrun, and verbs like understand and now love are getting used in the progressive, this happens. It's what happens in language. And learners need to understand that it's a natural progression. It's interesting about they, singular they, which has been in the language for centuries, everyone has their own opinion, uh, moving more and more into formal registers now. It's never been wrong, but it's, uh, it's always been rather informal, and it's getting more acceptable in formal registers. Another thing for students to understand that there are register differences and these can develop and change. Um, there are some differences between spoken and written grammar. Uh, some of them are quite important, so we need to point these out to the students, teach them about them, at least at more, more advanced levels. And we finally need to explain to our students that there is widespread resistance to language change, especially on the part of older people who don't like to see the language moving out of their control, <laughs> do we? <laughs> Examiners and employers are often members of this group of older people who don't want the language <laughs> to change. <laughs> and they're likely to prefer more conservative, more formal varieties and condemn others. So learners need to know about that. And finally, there's no need to panic. Um, all these things that strike us, like I'm loving it, these bits of variation and change, they're tiny ripples on an enormous surface of consistency. Yeah. Very nicely said. 
I would add, um, you know, when I do the workshops for the K-12 teachers, I'm amazed that when I work with uh, uh, content teachers who really have no training with ESL, so they know nothing about ESL grammar, language points, et cetera, and when we, I always bring to that first meeting three examples of ESL grammar to help, and give them maybe 20 pieces of input to try to figure out, is there a pattern here? The pattern is the grammar. And that's one I do is with the, the loving and liking, needing, et cetera. And when I bring up this point, they invariably say, what about McDonald's? They really, really know this, this McDonald's example that well. And what I point out there, again, at the appropriate level, these are native speakers who just haven't thought about this, the reason that this stands out is that it violates a rule, let's say, that you've internalized that you weren't aware of. It's the same reason that Xerox spells itself with a Z, and that the quick stop in Orlando is not spelled Q-U-I-C-K, but K-W-I-K, because it makes you remember it, right? So they've actually done a really good job with marketing. And that leads me to my, my other point, which is that when these questions come up in class, this is me personally, I um, am very judicious in how I will, whether I will explain something or not. The student raises his hand at the beginning level and says, I heard someone say X, Y, Z, and you're thinking, oh no, now you've opened up a whole other can of worms that the rest of the class isn't going to explain. And at that point I say, really? Did you really hear that? I.e., no you didn't, but you did, really, right? <laughs> or what I often do is, I'll say, can you, was it in the song, was it your roommate, tomorrow bring that back to class. Because again, it, it goes back to being a good teacher, not necessarily related, related to grammar, it's choosing your battles wisely. Sometimes you know that when you, just, mm -hmm. if I explain this to everybody, it's going to cause confusion. Mm -hmm. And when your students are looking for in a grammar class of all classes is mm -hmm. some sense of peace that, oh, there really is a pattern. And I can't do all of the examples, but I can do many of them. Or do you just say, that's level two. You'll have that in level two next semester. <laughs> and in that situation uh, that Keith just described, I always said, would you see me after class, please? And that took care of it, and I didn't have to deal with it in class. Um, and uh, I just want to uh, re uh, echo what Mike had said. Um, about the importance of teaching register. And one, one story that I like very much, uh, and how the older people are, are perhaps resistant to change. I wrote my first grammar book published in 1981, and I included me too, me neither, and I included he's older than me instead of I, explaining differences in register in both cases. And I sent the book to my ninth grade grammar teacher who taught me grammar. She was an ex whack and if you didn't learn grammar, she'd pound your forehead on the, on the table. Uh, <laughs> but boy, did I learn grammar. But not, not, not ESL grammar, that's for sure. The, my, I, when I started teaching ESL, I had to really learn a, a new pedagogical grammar. Um, but I think uh, she, she, was, she was shocked that I would, I would teach these uh, incorrect forms. Okay, the next one is for Keith. Question number 10 is about using the mother tongue, and this is not necessarily tied to grammar. It's just the general age-old question of ESL. Should I speak their language in class or not? Can I explain something in Spanish, French, whatever, or not? Or should I do this? And I'm gonna talk about this uh, in terms of direct explaining in that language and an indirect explaining in that language, but let me read a little bit here. Um, I don't have any research that says that first language, L1, should never be allowed in our classrooms. We hear this a lot, and it kind of makes sense, doesn't it, that if you spoke lots of English, then suddenly they would pick up lots of English. Actually, we know that's not the case. But there's been, I, I can think of my very first teaching job where I was actually called into the coordinator's office and told not to speak Spanish in class anymore which was a very good thing because we had a lot of French speakers in class who didn't speak any Spanish, but I thought I was helping the majority and that was okay. In my book, Vocabulary Myths, one of the myths is that teaching learning vocabulary, uh, in teaching and learning vocabulary, for example, translations are bad. In fact, research, research studies have included, that have included a learning condition in which learners have translations have almost always had better retention rates than with pictures and drawings and meaningful context, whatever that might be. Um, etc. I've seen this demonstrated with grammar uh, in my classes, but, uh, sorry, I've not seen this demonstrated with grammar, but I suspect the same. To me, it is ludicrous to pretend that students do not have a native language, that they do not have a whole mental capacity developed in a language already when they come to my classroom. 
So I use translations in grammar class in two ways. First, indirectly. Here's an example. In many first languages, no article is used when you're talking about professions. So for example, romance languages. My sister is doctor, right? I know that's what they do in their first language. So when I go to the board and I am teaching professions, for example, I, I'm well aware that who, in my class who speaks French, Spanish, Portuguese, etc. And I know that I, when I write the example on the board, I'm going to underline the word A. Maybe I'm not going to say, because in your language you do this, but I know that's what you're doing, and I'm now making this difference more salient. All right. And the second thing is directly. If I were teaching, I know that when I was teaching in an EFL setting in Japan and in Malaysia, uh, where everyone has the same L1, I did use, I, as long as the coordinator didn't know about it maybe, I did use the foreign language because I don't see that there's actually any bad result that's going to happen by using the first language judiciously. All right. I think Mike has something there. Yeah, um, I, I think this, this dogma goes back to the early 20th century when more and more British people were going to other countries to teach their language and they didn't want to have to learn the languages sure. that were <laughs> spoken in the country. So it's very convenient for them. Um, the way I conceptualize this for myself is just like this. Um, if I was now learning Mongolian, elementary Mongolian, would I want my grammar explanations in Mongolian? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bad old dogma. There's no basis for it. OK, I'm going to ask the panelists to give very quick answers uh, for the next few questions, and then we'll get to our final question. Uh, so Mike, yours is next, number 11. Michael? Yeah, we haven't got time to teach all the grammar what matters most. Without the time to cover a lot of grammar, which aspects would generally be most important to review for a 20-hour, 10-week, high-intermediate, advanced writing class? Uh, this is a very important question. It's essential to pri prioritize. You can't teach everything. You can only teach what matters most and perhaps not all of that. The teacher is the best place to make these decisions. The teacher knows best what points, in his or her view, most affect comprehensibility and acceptability in the student's speech and or writing. Um, and the teacher will deal with those points. Uh, a mistake like, can you lend me pen, is probably low priority from most points of view. A mistake like one I was told about the other day, I helped cook my wife last weekend. <laughs> <and so on. laughs> probably does need dealing with. <laughs> um, I would add to that that, yes, it it it's, the answer is that it depends. And nobody knows your students better than you do, so this is uh, a selection that you should make depending on the actual language needs of your students. And if anybody wants to know what I would teach in this particular 10-week class, email me and I'll give you my list. Um, OK, number 12, Mike? Yeah, uh, first language influence. Given that we have limited time to cover all the intricacies of grammar in our courses, is there a grammar inventory of key errors that speakers of a particular language tend to make and would therefore need to practice more? Well, for speakers of certain languages, yes, there is. There's a book called Learner English, edited by Swan and Smith. <laughs> Cambridge University Press covers the most important difficulties that speakers of about 20 or so languages and language groups have with English. It's a terrific book. <laughs> <laughs> it's a le Learner what English. Yeah. And that's my notes to say, see Learner English. <laughs> okay, any comment, Keith? Yep, just Learner English. Okay, that's it. Um, number 13. Very quickly, in grammar class, how much should we talk about the grammatical terms so that students would understand what they are learning without feeling overwhelmed or confused? The answer is as little as possible. How much terminology do students really need to know? For example, should we insist on students that students use the term past participle? No. Or third form or holding up three fingers? Is that equally acceptable, effective? I think that's a great idea. Um, what I want to say about terminology, I think students learn from understanding what's going on in examples, not from learning terminology, not from memorizing rules or um, um, memorizing uh, uh, 
uh, explanations. The focus always ought to be on examples and usage. Students should not be required to use terminology, define terminology, or uh, learn terminology, except there are, of course, occasional exceptions. Uh, but it's important to remember that we're teaching usage. We're not teaching subject matter. Anything? I think we've just got time to go to the last Oh, question. I think it is time now to go to the final question. Yeah. <laughs> this is for Michael. And for, um, I think it's time to hear from the student, <laughs> student's point of view. I'm going to read to you a letter that I got from this gentleman, Santiago Tso, um, over 20 years ago. He wrote this. Dear Mr. Swan, I got a question about English. Maybe you can help me. My question is, all the English books I read didn't explain why the verb in third person singular number has to add S or ES. The books also didn't tell how it was originated and who originated it. <laughs> <laughs> My view regarding this question is that it is troublesome. It is tantamount to slip of tongue. It lengthen the word and pronunciation. <laughs> what is your view? What is your view if the S or ES is omitted? Is it acceptable? Do you consider it informal? My experiment was that it was much easier and convenient. <laughs> it was much more efficient. I look forward to hearing from you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, let's hear it for Santiago Tso. He's absolutely right. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming today. We've really enjoyed this. <laughs>